Hey, Mr. Sam Bolt, are you out there watching me flounder on camera? Uh, you're, you're killing it. You look, you look great. <laughs>
trying as best he could to learn every aspect of the spirits industry. Because remember, this was not his forte. This was not his profession. So through a lot of trial and error, Gareth and his mother worked and worked and worked. And finally, in 2015, the first drops of courage and conviction ran from those beautiful copper pox stills, and a legend was born. And that legend is Virginia Distillery Company. And at Virginia Distillery Company, which is very hard to say if you've had too many drams, we do one thing, and we do it exceptionally well, and that is make American single malt whiskey. Which begs the question, what is American single malt whiskey? Who knows? No one knows. Now, it, this is kind of a big joke because we're a burgeoning category, right? So a lot of people are familiar with the rules of bourbon, the rules of rye, bottled and bond, rules of even Scottish single malt or Irish single malt. Um, not a lot of people fundamentally understand the rules of American single malt. Now, the irony is we are not yet codified, and I will explain. So the rules of American single malt are thusly. It must be made of water, yeast, and barley. No more, no less. This means that our mash bill is 100% barley. Now, I get the joke a lot where I'll have people come up, you know, American whiskey people are always ask, asking about mash bills. And they're like, what's in your whiskey? I'm like, barley. And they're like, no, no, but what else is in your whiskey? I'm like, barley and more barley. And the more barley, that's what we do. Um, so people are kind of getting used to this idea that we're not just using barley for enzymatic purposes. It is the backbone of our whiskeys, right? So number two. The whiskey must be made at one distillery. This means that everything from um, the initial fermentation all the way to maturation must happen at one distillery. That's fine for us because we get our grain dropped in, it goes into our Bobby mill, and we care for that whiskey all the way through fermentation, distillation, maturation, all the way through bottling at our facility in Virginia. So we check that box. The next thing, of course, the whiskey must be mature, uh, so distilled to matured in America. Obviously, we check that box, okay? So we're not, we're not doing something where we're moving things to Canada, we're moving it to you know, the UK. Everything is happening at our distillery. Next, the whiskey cannot be matured in a vessel larger than 700 liters. Again, this is not really a problem for us. Our largest vessel is a sherry butt, well under 700 liters. And what they are kind of talking about in this situation is this idea in some countries of using what's considered a ton, a T-U-N ton, um, that is a large marriage and or aging vessel. That's not something that we want to or are asking you know, for the permission to use. The last two are pretty important. It cannot be distilled at more than 160 proof um, or 80% alcohol, and it cannot be bottled at less than 80 proof or 40% alcohol. So everything we're gonna try tonight, all of our American single malt is going to be 46% or higher. So we're definitely well within that window. Now, did everybody get all those rules? I know that was a lot kind of coming at you really fast, but you know, all those rules. Okay, good, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some smiles and nods, awesome. So I want to, to just reiterate here, we are not official yet. All of these rules were created by the American Single Malt Committee, of which we are one of the founding members, and we are very proud to be so. So these founding members of the American Single Malt Committee came together and over a year ago took these rules that we agreed upon as a group to the federal government, asking them to codify and put into law what would be called American single malt whiskey. Now, I had a guy one day be like, why do you want to do that? Like, that limits you. And like, yes, it limits us in some ways. But what it also does is for all those whiskey enthusiasts out there and all those people that really enjoy buying our whiskey, you know that if anything in this country says American single malt whiskey, there is a standard of excellence inside that bottle. And that is very, very important to us. So the next most fun and cool thing is we are waiting and we think it's going to happen in the next 30 days, and I'm, I don't know, um, that the federal government is going to come down and say, the law is in place, we have ratified this, and American single malt whiskey is now the newest American whiskey category since the summer of love, 1969. So this is a very big deal in the industry. I'm seeing some um, things fly by. Yeah, it promotes accountability. It sure does. Um, I try not to call folks out, but we definitely have some stuff on the market right now that's 
that's a little in the gray area of how they're labeling. Um, this will allow us to define ourselves um, very seriously. When you see a label that says something close to American single malt whiskey, this will, you can say to yourself, okay, this might be amazing whiskey, but it is not American single malt whiskey as recognized by the federal government. Um, and yes, no restriction on grain origin. Uh, so, you know, so I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, some people do, some people don't. Barley doesn't grow very well in the United States. It really only grows in a very kind of like specific section of America's heartland. Um, it doesn't like the rocky east. It doesn't like the hot west, hot dry west. Um, so most of the barley that we get in North America, we are sourcing from Canada or the Midwest. Um, we work with over 600 farms, but yes, there is absolutely um, no restriction as to where we can get it. Cool, cool, cool. So any questions so far on the ratification, our hero origin story, before we start drinking some whiskey? I don't want to derail us too much, but how come did you go, how come you guys decided to specialize in American single malt and not necessarily other expressions? Yeah, that's a great question. So this was literally George's dream. Um, you'll notice that there is no Virginia distillery company gin. There's no distillery company vodka. Um, a lot of those, you know, early distilleries trying to get off the ground will create some unaged spirit um, to just get in the package and just like get some get some dollars coming in the door. That is not what George wanted. So Angela and Gareth were dedicated to seeing his vision through. The closest we've ever come to not making, a, you know, single malt whiskey is VHW, our other line of whiskeys that we're not trying tonight. That was the early product we released that what we did is we chose to source um, Scottish Bayside whiskey, bring it over 12 years, and then blend it with our American single malt to create an early stage opportunity for people to buy our whiskey. Ironically, as the years have gotten on and we have more and more and more um, of our own distillate, that ratio has actually shifted in BHW. So it used to be 80% imported, 20% us. It is slowly shifting the other way to be 20% imported, 80% us. So that is our blended malt whiskey. Everything you're trying tonight is our American single malt whiskey. So courage and conviction. This is our fantastic, beautiful single malt whiskey. Oh, I went ahead and one um, that we are going to try tonight. Um, courage and conviction itself stands on four specific. Then that we have our own specific principle. Number one is a world class distillate. You cannot make great single malt unless your distillate is excellent. Number two is the intentional influence of Virginia's dynamic climate. Number three is our blend of new world malt made in America and old world maturation. We import a lot of the casks we're going to try tonight from Europe. So we're bringing the old world to the new world. And last but not least, of course, is the inherited vision from George um, that compels us to make exceptional whiskey. So these guiding principles inform us every day. So on that note, we are going to drink some fantastic whiskey. So tonight we're going to start with our signature malt. Um, our, we, we call it our flagship. This is the introductor, introductory, there we go, to the line. Um, you're going to notice tonight that as we move through the line, every single whiskey that we have has some sort of stone fruit and spice. And this is because of certain techniques that Amanda is using. She is encouraging those in all of our whiskeys. So I like to say, I don't, I want to tell you what you're tasting first. I want you to just have a minute. I'm going to give it a good nose. I like to do the waft. If you guys ever seen me do a tasting before, I do the side to side waft, right? I like to close one nostril. It is Glenfiddichrin or former Glenfiddichrin. Now, now I'm, now I'm American single malt run. Hi, Chris Jones. Um, you've probably seen me do this before with my nose, Chris Jones. Um, so I like to, I like to, you know, try both, right? Because one is going to be slightly different, especially if you have a slightly deviated septum. I noticed mine is very sweet on the right side. I'm immediately picking up the fruit on the right side. And then the other thing that I like to do, I, I did this last night in a Instagram live. It always makes me laugh, but the spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch. Um, it truly is, if you lower your glass, you're going to get a lot of top notes that are coming off the edge of the glass. You raise it, you can get some of those base notes. And again, moving from side to side. So this just allows you to aerate the whiskey, get your nose ready. If you've seen me uh, do a tasting before, I like to do the chew. This, I, can I call it the rin chew? I don't know. I like to say, take a little bit in your mouth and chew your whiskey like this. It's hard to do when you're talking. Well, we're really like move around. Get it on the sides of your, your tongue, get it behind your frenulum. 
wrap it all around your gums. It just gives your mouth like a minute, a minute to get ready and a second to get used to the alcohol because your, your mouth and your tongue truly do shut down. Like when you throw alcohol on them, they're gonna immediately shut down. So what you wanna do is you wanna get the salivary glands going and then in the second sip, you really can taste it. So please, in the comments, tell me what you're tasting and smelling. Like a peach pit. Ah, very perceptive, Mr. Jones. Mm. So just to keep in mind, as you're sipping this, guys, there's certain reasons why this whiskey is so good. One of them is because in Virginia, we have some of the softest water in the world that is actually chemically very similar to what is in Speyside, Scotland. So, you know, you talk about going to Scotland, Speyside is this beautiful whiskey making region. A huge portion of that is because of the accessible water. We have water very similar that is filtered through the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, we have our own aquifer, um, you know, and Sam, correct me, we might call it actually the well, but we do, we do use um, a proprietary aquifer for our water. Um, the second thing is we use premium two row pale malt barley. The way to think about it is we're using two row barley because we're aiming for yield. We are not actively seeking to get flavors from the barley, which is very different than other whiskeys and very different than beer. So Amanda's goal here is to get the highest yield and the best result from using this specific barley. Um, the last one is we use a proprietary two yeast strain. No, I can't tell you what it is, I'm sorry. Um, but basically one of the yeast strains is for yield and one of them is for flavor. The, the biggest rule in whiskey is that if you do not create certain flavors during the fermentation process, they will not be present in the final whiskey, no matter no matter what you do. So if you, you're not actively choosing to create a fruity note during that fermentation time, you can't magically create a certain kind of fruity note in a barrel. Um, so what we're doing is we're using an extremely long fermentation. We're pushing it to 72 hours because we are trying to get that fruit note in our whiskey. Um, actually very, Chris, that's very, actually very similar to Glenfiddich. Glenfiddich has a 72 hour fermentation process as well. Again, they're also looking for a fruit note. Um, whiskeys you're going to find that have a little bit more of like a cereal note, honey, cereal, grain, bran. Those are going to be fermentation times that sit between 32 and 40 hours. So you can really make some strong choices in your fermentation time for your eventual whiskey flavor. So you guys ready? Solid for the core offering. Woo! Thanks, Brandon Weiss. Definitely toasted grain, 100%. So the official tasting notes for this one are apricot and ginger spice. So give it a little bit. A little more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. I absolutely get the apricot. That's why I said you're onto something, Chris, because, you know, getting that kind of, um, you know, the pitted fruit, a little bit of that kind of stone fruit, you, get, you just get it like right there. Um, also, apricot to me has a little bit of a, I was going to say like an umami. Uh, it's it's a fleshy fruit. It's not like a real, a real, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Less, like very far from a citrus, very fleshy like a mango. So I get a little bit of that. So, this kind of whiskey can only be achieved, as I mentioned in the beginning, with the highest quality of distillate. And that comes from our incredible, incredible production line. This is Harry Coburn. Um, you know, the cosmic joke around the distillery is Harry was not known for his modeling career. He was known for his incredible engineering skill. Um, but Harry is a friend of ours. He is still alive and kicking. Amanda goes to see him in Scotland a lot. So basically, after George passed, Harry stayed on and he advised Gareth. So every single inch of our production line to create the stunning distillate has Harry's fingerprints on it. I mean, literally and figuratively. So this supports a meticulous fermentation and distillation regimen. It never changes. We are very dedicated to using these techniques along with the most um, up-to-date technology. Um, you might know that Harry also was very uh, integral in building Kavalan Distillery in Korea. Um, so he was he was not shy about using modern technology, but also the tried and two practices. So what you're going to see um, in this photo, and I, I'm not sure which way it is for you guys, but on one side, if you see the blue piping, that is literally Bowmore Distillery. That is their stills. And on the other side with a spiral staircase, that is Virginia Distillery Company. So you can see that even in still shape, when Harry went out and sourced these stills for us, he made some pretty specific choices in the kind of still shape that he wants. Now, I'm, I'm going to give like a quick quiz for you guys. What is missing here? Like, what is the thing that you would expect 
in a lighter style malt like we're drinking tonight to see on a still. So typically in a whiskey that has this delicate mouthfeel, this like softness around it, you would see a reflux ball. Um, that reflux ball would, of course, bring the, the, the spirit up and it would force it back down, creating an internal double distillation, sometimes even an internal triple distillation. I find it fascinating that we do not have a reflux ball. We have a fairly thick line arm and we have a, fair, a fairly straight line arm. The irony is these are all touch points on the stills that you would see in Isla making a heavy, somewhat, you know, greasy sometimes, very, very rich di distillate. What we get in the magic of our climate is we get a distillate that has a beautiful mouthfeel, but it still manages to be kind of light and delicate. So just I want you to think about that as we go through this. Um, I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of having Go More or something like um, Ardbeg the hard drink because it's super peated, but I was trying to think of like an, an oilier whiskey, maybe Glen Glassa. This would be very typical of a Glen Glassa style, oily, heavy, round in the mouth, right? Um, but we have this delicateness. So you guys, I want you to chew more in this. I want you to think a little bit more about the still shape and we are gonna keep trucking. So one of the most important things with our whiskey tonight is we intentionally expose them to Virginia's dynamic climate, okay? The reason we do this is one specific human being. We have hot, humid summers. We have cold, crisp winters. Um, how hot would you say it gets, Sam? Would you say maybe sometimes 110? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, and it, is, it is humid as well. Um, yeah. That was coming from the mountains of North Carolina, and they, they said we're in the mountains of Virginia. That doesn't, that doesn't remove you from humidity. So, um, yeah, it definitely gets... Triple digits for sure. Triple digits, and we can get down below freezing, of course. Um, we, we've said we need to buy our warehouse guy, Brian, both a bikini and a fur coat because he's always having to deal with this temperature. Well, these not climate control warehouses are the gift of Dr. Jim Swan. So Dr. Jim Swan, I like to call him the international man of whiskey mystery, and um, one of the most handsome men in whiskey. Um, Dr. Jim Swan came in as a result of working with Harry Coburn. And Jim Swan convinced Gareth to not use climate controlled warehouses. Jim's whole argument was, if you put climate control in these warehouses, we're in this specific place, you're gonna take all sense of provenance from this whiskey. This whiskey could be made anywhere, why bother making it in Virginia, right? Spoiler alert, Jim, known as the Einstein of whiskey, was right. Because by not climate controlling our warehouses, we have been able to do in half the time what our Scottish and Irish friends do. We have such a dynamic climate with such intense temperature swings that in four years, we can create the whiskey that you just enjoyed that might take 12 or 15 in Scotland. Now, I wanna be clear, that doesn't mean our whiskey is better or worse. It doesn't mean their whiskey is better or worse. It simply means that we have this incredible climate influence, which is also something, whoa, okay, I don't know what that was. Everything's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, so, which is also cool about American whiskey, because in America, we're gonna have certain places like Westland whiskey up in Seattle, which is gonna have a climate very similar to Scotland, but then you're gonna have Stranahan's in the dry mountains, you're gonna have Balcones in the hot Texas. So we can actually show provenance in American single malt in a way they just can't do it in kind of the steady and cool Ireland and Scotland. So just something to keep in mind. Jim is also responsible as we move into our cask expressions for our incredible multi-cask maturation program. One of the biggest gifts that Jim left us when he left us was all of the contacts in his Rolodex to source some of the finest barrels in the world. So all of these beautiful barrels that we're about to try, they sit up on the hill in our two non-climate controlled warehouses, which you too can go in and sweat all you want and taste from the barrel. Um, and that has defined the style, the taste, and the quality of the whiskey we are sampling tonight. So that's enough talking. We've talked about our baby in blue. We've talked about courage and conviction. Let's get down to some of our cask breakout samples. So tonight we are going to start, we're going to jump back and forth just a little bit, so bear with me. Um, we're going to start with our bourbon. Now, the first thing I want you guys to notice, and I have them poured here, and I hope you can see them with the green screen. Uh, in this hand is our bourbon sample here, and in this hand is our cuvee sample. And I don't know if it's showing up as well, but 
could on camera, but you're going to see there's a pretty distinct color between those two whiskeys. Um, at Dis Virginia Distillery Company, we use all natural color. We have no color additives. Um, I want to be clear, I'm not judging. I have no opinion about using caramel coloring. It truly does not affect the quality or the taste of a whiskey. We just choose not to do that. That's not something that we do. Um, there is not a ban currently in the U.S. for using it, so I can't speak to if anyone else is. Um, so basically, we tend to source these casts primarily from Woodford Reserve and Willett in Louisville, Kentucky. My belief, I, I, will, go, I will go to the grave with this. It does not matter what the bourbon was, because everyone goes, oh, I, I definitely smell Woodford in this. Oh, yes, I'm a big Woodford fan. Well, I, I, maybe, okay, may, maybe if you drink Woodford every day of your life, um, and if you do, maybe maybe you should you know, slow down a little bit. But point being, what we're looking for is we're looking for exceptional casks purchased by exceptional human beings that have had exceptional care taken of them. And then we want those casts to be in fantastic condition when they come to us. So the idea behind that is that these casts are going to be tempered down. They're going to be calmed down by the addition of that bourbon, right? So the bourbon's going to suck up all the hot stuff and the bourbon's going to get that big, like opinionated, like punch in the mouth, like buttery and maple and vanilla. And then we're going to put our delicate American single malt into that cast. And we're going to let it rest for a minimum of four years. And you're going to get all of the beautiful bourbon notes, but you're really going to get a dynamic relationship between the big fruit that we've created dur during fermentation and then also those slightly tempered down bourbon cast notes. Um, for those of you who are new to whiskey, we say first fill because it's the first time we filled it, but obviously it's the second time liquid's been in it because the first fill was officially bourbon. Oh, that's a great question. What qualifies as, as an exceptional cast? Okay. Well, um, I can tell you some, some hot buttons. Uh, they don't leak. That sounds pretty basic, but you'd be amazed um, at some of these people that pretty, like, you know, just like kind of churn and burn um, their, their virgin casts. Um, you are also gonna, gonna get a situation where it's been stored correctly. Um, it's, it's been stored and or moved correctly. So the cast has not had damage done to it. Um, you're also gonna get a cast that Woodford having chosen it is going to be sourcing from a certain quality of cast maker. So they're sourcing from a certain level of um, white American oak. So there's there's kind of a, a bunch of processes that happen before the cast comes to us. So we know it's quality wood by a quality cooperage that's been taken care of. So those are the three big ones. So by the time it gets to us, it doesn't mean it's full of holes, possibly has a mold issue, might have to have some damage or repair because all of that is money sucking and quality losing. That's not where I was going. Quality lessening. There it is. Um, so let's see. Okay. What do you guys think? Stone fruit and spice. Now there's a lot, there's a lot of other things going on in this whiskey besides stone fruit and spice, but and no, no, yeah. no, a bit more muted on this one than on the first one. The first one, the fruit kind of punched you in the mouth. Like it was really prevalent when you hear it. Totally right. muted. It's there, but you kind of have to get, you know, you have to kind of dig for it. So Chris, um, this is the one that um, when I'm talking to, to single malt lovers, this is the one to me that is the most similar to Glenfiddich, Glenlivet, your mm -hmm. more delicate fruity space eyes. This is a good entry point for folks that are, that are, yeah, exactly. That are coming to cast American cast single malt. Yeah. So, so on that note, if you guys are fans of, of those whiskeys, is there maybe a similarity you're finding between some of their notes and some of our notes? Yeah, I get the musky, like the dampness, the uh, like a, a box of wet Cheerios, maybe just a hint of it. It's funny that you say that. We have a specific expression that has a lot of Cheerios in it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do. Yeah. It's like it's like Cheerios with a spice. Yeah, oh, I'm seeing very mellow, very mellow, little dusty. Yeah, that's it's always funny about barley. Barley does have a little bit of a dusty note. It's like you kind of went down to your grandmother's basement and found all the the, all the church. What do they call when you go to church and it has like the program <laughs> what am I trying to say bulletin there it is the church bulletins and they're all covered in dust um so the official notes here are green apple and pear I definitely get a granny smith on this one and also cedar and cinnamon so you might that. also yeah so so Michael also sometimes cedar I don't know about your grandparents but my grandparents not only had dusty basements but they would put cedar in their closets to get rid of moths so it's like, it literally evokes me being in my grandparents' house. 
Also, my grandparents drink whiskey, so. Scuppernong. Okay, Marcus Moore, you're going to have to, I, I am not a familiar with the word scuppernong, which it's hard to stump me, but I, I don't know what scuppernong is. Is it a fruit? Okay. It's a gold muscadine or muscadine as it were. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm definitely from the South, so I've had muscadine wine before. Grapes. Okay, I'm gonna have to go out and try that scuppernong. So Tonight, we have the pleasure of trying a single cask as well. So what I would love for you guys to do, I'm going to go a little bit more into the details of the single cask a little later, but I want you to just take a moment and to open up your single cask bourbon. I believe the number is 420. And I want you to take a minute and to compare. Um, this is going to be up in the high 50s. Um, and I want you to take a moment and compare this beautiful single cask bourbon to what we call our cask expression. Now, the biggest difference here is that when we talk about the bourbon cask expression, this is a blend of many of the bourbon casks that we have our single malt in. This is literally one. So there's gonna be some really specific differences because remember, when Amanda is blending for the expression, she's aiming for the house style. When she has a single cask that's exceptional, she's letting it sing on its own. So this is gonna be a little hotter guys. So if you wanna add a little water, no shame in that game. This single cask was, um, was bottled at just under six years. So I think it's literally right around 5.79 years. So this is going to be slightly older. This is definitely gonna sit right around four years, five years. And this is gonna sit just below six years. I think people are going back and forth between uh, just a regular bourbon cask finish and a single barrel bourbon cask finish yes and they're like two different expressions i totally agree completely uh, different right to me they're, to me they're not in day to me a single bourbon cask is it has much more character it's much more complex it has basically best of both worlds from the first two expressions we've tried it has this it has uh more prevalent nose than than, than the second one um sort of like the first one we tried uh, but mm -hmm. then on the palate, it's a lot more complex. There's lots going on. So mm -hmm. there is that fruit, there is that sweetness, but there's also spice that I think was a little bit missing on the first one. Lighter. Yeah, what I what I noticed too is you're going to get like a little bit more, like like the fruit changes slightly. The fruit does move into a slight citrus universe, um, a little bit more than our typical stone fruit. I find that the green apple is tempered with a little bit more of a sharpness. Mm -hmm. So we have our official tasting notes here um, from Amanda, the woman herself. So this is 58.8%. Yeah, yeah, Creme brulee, which fat, I, I don't know that I get that. I'm not sure I get the creme brulee, but I can see why. Um, graham cracker, there's that citrus coming in with the orange oil. Now, now I always love these subtleties because it's not just sniffing. It's not like just a fresh orange. You bite a fresh orange. It's, it's the oily part of the orange. It's the richness. Again, an umami quality to the orange. And then the spice of pine tree and cinnamon. And I definitely get, I definitely get some of that pine tree. That is present for me. I, I can kind of see candied orange, but yeah, yeah. I'm having a hard time with some of those. But the graham cracker ones throwing me. I'm not I'm not getting the musty basement on this one. I'm getting very fruit forward and more complex. Isn't it funny that uh, yeah. like us whiskey nerds were sitting here talking about mmm, musty basement. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. I yeah. love to taste an old shoe box in the closet with shoes. I mean, you, you never know what you're gonna get. No, you don't. You don't. Um, you know, and that's, there's a, a certain kind of magic to opening an old book that has the vanillin that, that's in the pages. Um, that's one of the reasons that old books smell so beautiful. They have the same chemical as casks do. Yeah, a little drying and tannic. Um, Stephen, I think some of that is coming specifically from the higher ABV. It's always going to shock your mouth a little bit. It's always going to have a little bit more of a perception of dryness. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely find the drying. Uh, I could sing, sip that single cask all night. Well, I got, I got as a spoiler news for you. Should, should um, they choose this cask, you could sip this single cask all night or at least until the bottle runs out. Um, so cool. So uh, I'm going to swing that. Jenny, by. question, question yes, for you real quick before we move off this to the yeah. next one. Um, I think there was a question about an age difference between this expression and the very first one, the signature one we tried. Yeah. So, so the signature, everything behind. I'm sorry. Me. I'm sorry. Not the signature, yes. uh, the regular mm -hmm. bourbon cask. Yeah, yeah, no, same, same. So everything behind me is going to be right over four years. So it's a little over four years. Um, okay. It used to be standardized four years, but now that our whiskey is aging a little bit more, some of these are creeping into five, occasionally six. 
um, but mostly a four year standardization. Both of the single casts that we're trying tonight are gonna be just under six years. So they're just slightly older. And that really matters going back to the dynamic climate conversation, right? Because, because we have these incredible temperature swings. So you're gonna notice that it's not just that it's a single cast, it's that additional exposure to the climate. It has, it has gotten more from the cast that it was in. Um, but, you know, so that, no, excellent question. And thank you for reiterating that, uh, Michael. So yeah. Uh, can I, can I actually have... ask a couple of follow-up questions on this Absolutely. since we're on the topic of age? Uh, so two questions. The first one is, what is your oldest expression to date? Like, when did you actually lay down the first batch of battle? So that's one. And before you answer it, uh, the follow up to that would be um, from experience. And again, like this is strictly my palate. And so that's very subjective, obviously. Uh, uh, single malts, uh, I'm not sure about American, but scotches for sure tend to benefit from time in wood, right? Because that's a secondary wood. So they don't get that initial um impact of the wood on on the juice so like the more they spend in the cast usually the, the, the more complex they become uh with bourbon it's quite the opposite like there is a point tipping point where they become over oaked so with with the american single malt and with your product specifically have you guys reached that point where you know hey this is a sweet spot for us okay so so i'm gonna break that down a couple ways um question number one uh the, the first courage and conviction was literally distilled um in november of 2015. Okay. Uh, Courage and Conviction as a brand was not released until 2020, but it was released, you know, just at a four year. So what that means is it was bottled at four years, got to the market early 2020 at a four year old, right? I cannot speak to, Sam, this is where I get you to step in. I cannot speak to if we still have a barrel from that original barreling that is still aging. So at mm. that point, it would be taking, oh, math, it would be taking us to... Nine? Yeah, just just about nine years. Uh, I was going to say that there may be one or two floating around. Uh, okay. Cool. Good to know. Now, Good I did to hear know. a rumor today, Sam, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, we have an 11-year-old hiding somewhere in the, the warehouse. Yes, so, please. Yes. And, and like, so, so, but if you do the math there, it's going... Hmm. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see about that. Um, so I know that we have some hidden older casks. I also know that Amanda is actively investigating what what the eventual um, outcome will be. So far, to my knowledge, Michael, at, le at least what Amanda has told me, because obviously I don't know every cask in our warehouse, we've not had a tipping point. We definitely had stuff that was too young that were like, okay, you know, let, let, you know, this specific white wine cask needs six years or this specific like sherry cask needs six years. But so far, I don't know that we've had an overcooked one. Sam, have you heard otherwise? No, I think that's what's so cool about um, where we are um, in all of this is that, is that we're learning constantly. Um, Amanda likes to talk about late bloomers for sherry and, you know, Cuvée's this new, sorry, you're jumping ahead a little bit, but okay. STR is this, uh, Cuvée's this new STR thing that people don't really, fully understand yet. So it's really exciting to be, you know, where we are with all this because, uh, yeah, we're learning every day. Uh, it's all coming out really nicely, but um, you can't be 15 years in if you're not 15 years in, you know? Yeah. That's very true. So true. Well, that, 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 you know, that, that begs the next question, which is, um, should we come to visit you? I'm thinking about perhaps an opportunity to taste some of these hidden gems and doing something with them, but that's conversation down the road. Well, that is, that is of course at the discretion of uh, Ms. Beckwith. I cannot make any promises, <laughs> especially if I'm being recorded. <laughs> so, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Um, I, I will say uh, the one thing that Amanda kind of puts her foot down is when we have a liquid that is so exceptional and we are really looking at it for a release at some point, she'll mm -hmm. she'll be like, guys, stop drinking it. If you keep drinking it, there's none to release. And I'm like, I hear you. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> but we do have some cool experiments happening right now. Um, going back to the Cheerios comment, uh, we have a particular barrel, a Fino, that is getting older and older at the moment that literally tastes like Honey Nut Cheerios. It is the craziest thing. You'd never assume that Fino Sherry would create that, but it does. So Yes, please. Again. I know, right? Yes, please. So moving right along, um, because I know we have a lot to taste and... Uh, you know, we're, um, I, I am, I'm not uh, in a hurry to run away, but I also don't want to keep you guys super long. 
So Courage and Conviction Cuvée Cask. Now this is the one that Sam just mentioned. Um, that is the STR cask. So this is one of the biggest gifts that Dr. Jim Swan gave to us. Um, we have the capability to source from three different countries, Portugal, Spain, and France. The goal here with all the casts we source from, from these winemakers is to get big, bold, opinionated, fruity fruit, fruit reds. That is, that is the goal here. So everything, all these casts have had Merlots, Grenache, Bordeaux blends. We're not going for like saucy nose. We're not going for like, you know, like tannic Riojas. We're going for these big, rich, fruity, cold night, um, you know, warm day reds. Now, the reason for this is, is again, Amanda is seeking to enhance and dance with the fruit note um, that we create in our whiskey. So STR, let's talk about it for a second. And Sam, always chime in if you want to. STR is a process that was literally pioneered by Jim Swan. It means shave, toast, rechar. It can also mean shave, toast, reassemble, depending on what you're doing. So the idea behind it is you got this cask. It had wine in it. Wine leaves a lot of gunk behind in a cask. It leaves residual sugars. It can leave yeast. It can leave bacteria. It can leave all kinds of things because obviously, you know, wine is a fermenting product in barrel. So the idea behind this is you're going to go in and you're going to clean out all that grunk and all that mess, right? You're going to get it out of there. You're going to take it almost all the way down to the water line of the wine. And then you're going to retoast just in front of the water line. And then you might also rechar usually just about a char one. We're not going for a big, thick char, we're going for a little tiny char. What this does is it allows us to use these wine casks to have them be at a certain level of quality. And in addition, you still have the capability of accessing what the wine was. This is the exact opposite conversation of bourbon. In this case, it actually does matter. The wine adds color, the wine adds fruit, the wine adds flavor. So we are accessing the qualities of the wine that was in that cask to create this cuvee. So, Everybody, please lift this to your nose and your mouth. You're going to notice I held it up a little bit earlier, but the color is extremely different. You are getting some of those coppery red notes from the wine itself. Beautiful, beautiful, as, beautiful. As people are tasting it, I'll tell you, I guess, a bit of an insight into the prime barrel. So we've been doing it for quite some time now, and we obviously had our chance, chances, you know, plural, at multiple wine finished casks and as you probably well aware that seems to be the rage or has been a rage for the for the last six months or so maybe more and personally and i think i speak for a lot of people in the club um to me it's hit or miss and it's mostly miss than a hit most of the time because what happens is um it's really difficult to execute a proper wine finish with the tannins and with the wine not basically overtaking the initial spirit the native spirit and so you end up not really drinking bourbon, you're not you're not really drinking wine, and you just just drink this Frankenstein of, um, you know, of a, of a liquid that's not really um, impressive for the most part. Uh, and so when the finish, but but having said all that, when the wine finish is done properly, when it's not overcooked, when it's not over oaked, when it's not super drying, over tannic, then it could be fantastic. And we have uh, selected a few wine finishes that were just great. But, uh, but that's sort of like the prime barrels relationship with wine finishes. I, I, I will echo you, Michael, like I am not historically in all my years been a fan of wine finishing. Um, and it's for the same exact reasons you're talking about, because I, I it's like you tend to like you pick this up, you get this big red wine nose, and then the whiskey is sort of like backstage while the, the wine is like singing opera and, and you're like going like, well, you just murdered your whiskey. Um, one thing to keep in mind, just for clarification, Every single whiskey we are trying tonight is first maturation only. None of these are finishing casks. So the bourbon lived in bourbon its entire life. The wine lived in the wine SDR cask its entire life, the cuvee cask. Um, so we are not taking it from American oak and then moving it into a secondary finishing cask in the case of courage and conviction. I do think that makes a significant difference. I, I think so. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. So that, that's an yeah. important clarification. Okay. Yeah. And, and thanks for bringing it up. That was an excellent segue. I'll send you 20 bucks. Um, so blueberry and fig, fig Newtons. I like yeah, it wasn't fig notes. It was fig I, Newtons. I'm getting fig Newtons. Yeah. And it's it's weird. Like it's, and I only can say that because I recently ate some fig Newtons. Um, and I can, so I can relate to it, but there are hints of blueberry. I, I think there's yeah. a comparison to you guys and Copper Fox. 
Um, but I feel that Copper Fox is probably replenishing their finishing barrels, whereas you guys aren't. And so your finish is a little bit more elegant. Well, thank you. I, I can't I can't speak to Copper Fox, um, <laughs> but yeah, but just but just to reiterate one more time because you use the word finishing difference in the finish of the whiskey and a finishing barrel just to just to be uh, to clarify there because the yeah. finish of the whiskey you know obviously is the, the the lasting notes and in this one I do agree with the blueberries I get a little of a blueberry I also get a little bit of like a raspberry um the official tasting notes everyone ready Here yeah is. dried cherries with cocoa and ginger so I'm definitely getting the cherry I, I mean you know, I, I'm the definitely getting the cocoa now that you yeah. said it yeah lots of cocoa almost like cocoa puffs right and I, i've been monitoring yeah. the chat a bit and i think people are uh, largely agree with me on a, on a fact that this is not overcooked by any means mm -hmm. i think the marriage of um uh, you know the wine casks and and the initial spirit is nicely done uh this is very well done you know wine finish for all intents and purposes like this is good it's good release. well i will pass that on michael thank you so you can see in real time, Kube cast a 2300 and all of these beautiful notes. Again, this is just under six years old. Okay, so we're coming in just under six. Um, it was filled in 2017, 59.2%. And this one is to me revelatory. It is very different. Very, I have to say, and, and this, is, th this is the same with this as it was with bourbon. Uh, the single cast seems to be that much better like the, 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 and now i'm glad like a kudos to you to to for us to have to, to have us try this stuff in a particular order because it definitely highlights the single barrel uh, releases it yeah to me it has, to me it has much more complex and and richer nose like I'm, I'm able to pick up more than just a couple of notes here i haven't tried it yet but uh like i already know this is going to be good this, this is Amazing. exquisite well i will definitely pass that on chris i think, I yeah, think amanda would love to hear it um, especially, you know, cause you, you drink a lot of, um, you know, Scottish single malts that have a hundred years ahead of us. Right. Um, but I, I think the big thing, uh, for this, for me is 59.2%. There's a, there's a gentleness. There's still, there's still a gentleness on the nose. There's still a, a delicate sensibility about all of our whiskeys. And, and I dare I say it, I'm going to say it our whiskeys have a feminine quality to them. And, and I don't mean like biologically feminine, I mean like spiritually feminine. Um, there is a little bit of a, of a softness to everything that we're creating, um, even when there's an intense complexity. Uh, and I appreciate that because I, you know, I do feel that sometimes you get these single casks and you have, you have unique tasting notes, but they're so aggressive that you know, it almost burns off the tip of your tongue before you notice anything. But there's still, again, with this higher ABV, it's just, it's just gentle, you know. So if, my question for you guys: If you hold we... a small amount in your mouth on this one, you can really get that that cinnamon note and the burn. Oh, but you said not... cinnamon. Yeah. Yep. Cinnamon is an official tasting note. I get a little bit of a red cinnamon gum, like a little bit of a trident cinnamon. I'm, I'm um, getting you... the old school red hots. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Not the, not the big ones, the dots that came on the wax sheet where you'd peel them off. Yes. And you'd well, and they would get one stuck in your tooth and you'd be like, oh crap. And then like yeah. an hour later and they would you'd get a hit of that. That's what okay. I'm getting. I am I I'm definitely funny is, um that's a little bit more indicative of rise. You get a lot of, like that that cinnamon bubble gum. Yeah. You know, kind of that note. Yeah. I think Brandon has it like uh, that's exactly what it tastes like to me. Um a mold winter wine in, in a very good way. Yeah, mold, mold, mold wine. Like, we'll, we, I think I think that's coming from that spice. So official tasting notes for this beautiful cast number uh, 2300, 2300, which may be the 2300 build, um, is soft red berry, chocolate. You're going to get chocolate on almost any time you're experiencing a wine cast from us. You're going to get some kind of cocoa, dark cocoa, bitter cocoa, um, walnuts, and of course, Chris Jones, cinnamon is your finish. And this is also for red cinnamon. Th this is also four years old, or just about mm -hmm. four. Just like the first single cast we tried, this is just under six. So it's oh. like it's like right around like five point nine eight, so just under that mark. So that makes me want to taste your nine and alone all that much more. <laughs> yep. Well, one of the beauties about working for this company 
is that I have some really strong hints as to what's coming down the pipe. And it's only going to get better and better and better and more exciting and more interesting and more age. Um, so that's that's one of the cool things. Um, you know, we're small, we're mighty, uh, but we have a lot of, uh, dare I say, cool shit coming. So, nice. well, like okay, cool bear shit. with me. I'm going to kind of like cool shit too. So, although we are not tasting a single malt sherry tonight, single malt sherry, a single cask sherry tonight, we are going to be tasting what I consider my favorite of the cask expressions. I am a sherry head. I'm a sherry nerd. Went to Spain, studied sherry, love the sherry. Can talk about sherry all day. Um, what is so cool about this particular expression? Um, this is the one in red, right? So we don't have a single cask of this. But it's, it's the burgundy red over here. Um, we don't just use one kind of sherry. So we're not in a situation where we're only choosing Oloroso. Um, and I don't want to denigrate that at all. Whenever I say these things, it's not one is good, one is bad. It's just a comparison. But a lot of whiskeys out there are using Oloroso as their primary finishing, not maturation cask, finishing cask. And they're using Oloroso in a way that they are basically renting the casks. Um, they buy casks. They put cheap Oloroso in it for a period of time. They throw their Oloroso away. Um, and then they use those casks for their whiskey. And the reason for that is because a lot of people on planet Earth that are not me are not sherry heads. They're not out in the universe drinking a ton of sherry. So there is a higher demand in whiskey to use sherry casks, and there are sherry drinkers. Fundamentally, it makes sense. It's supply and demand. This is not mm -hmm. what we do. So our sherry expression, so again, not a single cask, but a sherry expression, is a combination of pheno sherry. So non-oxidized, very, very dry, very low sugar, bright tone, white wine sherry. Oloroso, which has those middle tones. So it's like rich, you know, beautiful, nutty middle tones. And Pedro Jimenez. So Pedro Jimenez is the sherry, if you're not a sherry person. Uh, the grapes are laid out to dry in a process called El Solo. And they are literally turned into raisins. So Pedro Jimenez, unlike Fino, which is like literally like a dry white wine, is like drinking a syrupy, syrupy, raisiny, almost like a like an ice cream uh -huh. topping. So all three of those sherries are coming together to combine to make our sherry cask expression. Now, what's cool, because I actually work with the cask society and I work with a lot of the single cask sales, you can purchase at our distillery just a Fino or just an Oloroso or just a Pedro Jimenez. So if that's your bag, I'm the woman to call. Um, but this a is a combination one, of all three. Please. Yes. Yeah, I know. Oh, Chris, I've had one of our PX just just those expression. It is, it's it's insane. It's it's true. I mean, this this is this is a cobbler in a glass. So I know it's so good. Yeah. If I Je can, Je Jenna, let me uh, chime in for a second, and uh, I'll do a piece of shameless promotion. I think not just for me, but sure. for you as well. Uh, prior to having this call, Jenny and I actually have met where happened to live in the same city. And uh, we talked about many interesting things. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about is, you know, Jenny is a marketing uh, guru for, for the brand and she does That's all generous. types. Well, you are. So uh, she does all types of events around the country, not necessarily just in my neck of the woods. And she graciously invited, you know, the Prime Battle members to attend some of these events where they do get to taste some of the expressions that are not readily available. So I'm just throwing it out there for our premium members. Uh, I'll be sharing with you guys the next event that comes up. And uh, if you guys are um, around or want to participate, we can definitely make it happen. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And you know, um, as Parrish knows, I joined the company in March. So there's still so much work to be done um, getting out there and, and meeting whiskey enthusiasts. Um, and I'm looking forward to a really robust 2024 calendar. And that is one of our goals is, is to, you know, build a community with all of you that are fans of our brand and say, yo, I'm going to be in Chicago and I'm doing this invited tasting or, hey, I'm going to be, you know, in Denver. We just opened up Colorado. We're going to be at Aspen Food and Wine, you know, so that, that, you, that people know where they can come try things. One of the biggest places that we will pour new releases, such as the Courage and Conviction Double Cask, is going to be at these invited events, um, you know, where people get a chance to try cool stuff. So yeah, I, I, I love that. Thank you for saying that, Michael. I really appreciate it. Um, so any thoughts on the sherry, which is clearly obviously the best whiskey you've ever had? 
I'll, I'll say I'll say this about the sherry and people yeah. that are listening and on this call have heard me say this a million times. I came to bourbon from from scotch like the scotch was the first love for me. And so this expression particularly reminds me of, the, of those scotch days like this is probably the most scotch out of all of them. Well, scotch like out of all of them or malt like out of all of them in a, in a good way and for a good reason. Right. So the, the sherry finish has been like a standard in, in the scotch world. Like uh, the, there are brands that made the entire living just by finishing their stuff in Scott, like Glendrona comes to mind, even McAllen does some, some to, to some degree. So, uh, and, and this is, this is good. It's, 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 it's unique in the way that you guys use all three. Normally people tend to like pick their favorite and stick to that. And we've done some bourbon releases uh, finished in PX Sherry, which turned out to be great. Um, so this is unique from the standpoint of having to use all three um in, in you know in in you know in a composition so to speak but i like it i agree I, michael i think this is one of you know when i when i talk about what makes us um different you know the str cask obviously that's something that we're known kind of across the country for but the use of multiple sherry casks it's something i haven't encountered previously in my career um so this is something that i feel that makes us very unique and also again sherry is close to my heart um so i love this expression I, I, I'm going to go ahead because because of time and just say official tasting notes, fig, we got fig out there a couple times. Um, definitely people call that fig in the signature malt because it this is part of that blend. Um, apricot, obviously, that is a big note in our signature mal malt as well, and ginger and clove. So a lot of the things that you identified in that very first whiskey, of course, we have a certain backbone to that whiskey, but I tend to find that these notes that are in the sherry cask, the, those are the kind of like the top, the obvious notes, the notes that sing when you're enjoying the signature malt. So just to give you a little bit of you know thought as we wrap this up and bring it back in, all of these whiskeys are brought together in the signature malt. And this is Amanda. This is Amanda Beckwith, if you've ever gotten a chance to meet her. Um, it's very funny. Uh, she and I are both short brunettes, look nothing alike, that people are always like, are you Amanda? And I'm like, no, I'm not Amanda. Um, Amanda was mentored by the blender Nancy Fraley, who has her um, fingers in many, many incredible whiskeys across this country. But Nancy taught Amanda everything she knows. We use slow water reduction in the style of Nancy. This is something that takes Amanda an enormous amount of labor and time to do, but I do believe it informs, again, the delicacy of our whiskeys, because um, we're not just jamming them together. We are actually taking day by day, almost over a 12-day period of reducing the whiskeys down and marrying them together. Courage and conviction, backbone, 50% bourbon cask. So that is truly like, like the base note of the whiskey. Then you have a tw approximately 25-25 split with the cuvee and the sherry. So all these beautiful notes, like like I, I like to say it's like a symphony. They're all different instruments. They come together. And Amanda is our maestra who brings it all into this gorgeous song. Um, we, are, we are enormously proud of the work she's doing and she just keeps doing cool work. So cool things are coming. Um, so that, if you guys would like, and I hope you do, if you have a little bit of the signature malt left, um, or I try to keep a little bit in all my glasses, just to go back and maybe Give that signature malt a nose again. See if you can pick up some of the notes that we covered, like the cedar. It's in there. It's not obvious, but it's in there. It in there. Cinnamon, obviously in there. Yeah, so you're going to get a little bit of all of these beautiful casts coming together. Um, I think that the signature malt is something that, at least to me, if you were getting to know um, Virginia Distillery Company for the first time, this would be something that um, it's a very easy entry point. It's like, oh, okay, I like malts. It's very, very delicate malt. feels feels pretty good, but also has a lot of complexity. So, uh, Jen, before yeah. I, I know we well, first of all, I, I know we have uh, we don't have a, a hard stop. Like we can go on. I know, I know it's a bit, it's getting a bit late on the East Coast, but uh, there are a few questions that I think are worth at least addressing. Um, so let's see. Uh, okay, so we somebody, uh, Fran, asked, I have heard of some distilleries, i.e. Westland, choosing to stop importing sherry casks due to the drop in quality that you mentioned. Do you see that happening to VDC, or do you have an established relationship with high-quality producers? Ah, that's a great question. So we have a very specific um, relationship, contract relationship, 
with Jose y Miguel Martin Bodega. Uh, they supply all of our barrels. So unless something happens to their bodega and they go under, we are not sourcing random sherry barrels. We are sourcing from one of the best bodegas in Jerez. Okay. Yeah, uh, the other question. question, the other question, I think Sam already addressed, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, is the STR technique being used in all types or just a cuvee? Uh, currently, for us, just a cuvee. Um, mm -hmm. There is there is the possibility because we, uh, Sam, am I getting in trouble? Um, we are doing some experiments and some work with white wine right now. So I do think at some point, um, if it was useful to a white wine cask, we would begin using it, you know, on mass. Right now, we don't have a plan to release a large scale white wine matured whiskey. So right now it's not something that we're putting into practice. Okay. What, what yeah, was the proof on the uh, sherry one? Uh, it, oh, it is all, it's 46. So every single thing behind me is 46%. Okay. And then the two single casts, I think one came in at 58.8 and one came in at 59. I wanna make sure I tell you that right. Yeah, so the um, the cuvee was 59.2, and I believe the bourbon was 58.8. Okay. Is there a chance that – I like what you've done with the three types of sherry. Is there a chance to maybe get a high-proof concoction in a mash tun and uh, bottle that? That would be an Amanda question. I, ca I can't I can't uh, co-sign on that one. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't agree with you. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. Just curious. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it would be fantastic. I'll definitely tell you our single cast cherries um, at the higher proofs are, they're incredible. They're really, really incredible. Um, so, I mean, there's, as it's always that thing, Chris is like, there's a chance. <laughs> I can't make any promises, but there's a chance. So you're, you're telling yeah. me there's a chance. There's a yes. chance. And maybe a, even a bespoke blend. Like if you take three that you've done three sherry mm -hmm. and they're all very high proof. And then you take a blend of those three. Well, actually, Chris, this is a good segue. Uh, before going to the whole bespoke blend route, uh, let's take baby steps. And in that, what I mean by that is uh, there is a surprise in this kit. And one of these samples, well, I insisted on including this sample in this kit specifically for one reason only. Um, uh, we wanted to poll the audience that will be drinking uh, and participating in these events uh, to tell us whether or not they like it enough for us to actually bring in this specific sample or barrel. Uh, it's interesting how uh, we are looking at the slide that showcases QVA cast number 2300, because that's exactly the sample that I'm talking about. So um, I just, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I did put a link in the chat um, to a survey. Um, if you've done this a couple of times with us, you know, this is pretty much uh, standard operation now where we poll the people that participated in the tasting to basically give us a rundown and, and rank everything that we've tasted today. I'm sure people behind the brand would love to know as well. Uh, and I yes. can share this live um, as you guys are taking it. Shouldn't take you more than two minutes. That's literally like five questions in there, six mm -hmm. questions. Um, and um, And we'll see where we go from there. So the baby step that I was referring to would be uh, one of these single barrel casks, and then uh, we'll develop a relationship and perhaps do something more, um, you know, intriguing down the line. Does that make sense? Well, we do. Um, we have a program coming out this fall that is called the Draftsman, and it is going to give individual uh, retailers the opportunity to literally blend a cask um, <gasps> and decide on the percentages and decide what that would be. So if that's something that you guys are all interested in, I can certainly let Michael know about that. Yes, um, I'm sure Parrish would be happy to share it. And, um, you know, you guys could do like a, a you know, a, a vote and, um, you know, and see what would, you know, make you the most happy depending on your blend. So that is something that's going to be accessible very, very soon. So I did want to mention something that's really important to, to my heart. There's sort of two things. Um, you know, I joined the company in March and uh, there's been so many changes and so many things going on. But, you know, right after I joined within just about two months, we won Distillery of the Year and Whiskey of the Year at the London Spirits Competition. This is enormous, guys. So, yeah, you know, so, and I, I talk about this from a very personal place. I spent decades in Scottish single malt. So this means that we took our beautiful American single malt to their turf, to London, right? And we 
took home the grand prize. We won the big pig. And um, it was deeply meaningful to us, not only as an homage to George to bring the single malt tradition to America, but for us to say, oh my gosh, we're doing something right. So the, sing the signature malt that you guys tried tonight, uh, are the, the blue bottle, that is the one that won whiskey of the year against numerous Irish and Scottish and Japanese single malts, as well as a ton of other spirits and a ton of other whiskey. Um, so it was just something that was very important to us. The second thing I want to give like one of those shameless plugs to is we recently launched um, uh, ASM Academy. So if you are an individual that wants to dig a little deeper into what ASM is, all of our friends that make ASM, um, you can literally log on to asmacademy.com. You can take it and then you get this cute little card that says, I know a lot about whiskey. Um, and you can learn more about um, what we do and what some of our fellow whiskey makers do here in America. Um, because, you know, it is important to us as a member of the Single Malt Whiskey Committee, American Single Malt Whiskey Committee, to, um, to, to spread the word, to evangelize what we do. Um, so on that note, last but not least, if you are feeling super frisky, um, I also run a program called Cask Society. This is for individuals who want to individually, non-licensed non and not for resale, purchase a cask to uh, mature at our distillery. It's a very specific program. If you want any information on that, um, and I can put this in the chat, you can email me at Jenny, that's me, at vadistillery.com, and I can talk to you about what that cask program looks like. Um, and that is separate from working with someone like Michael. So this is this is for individuals only. And I, I just want to say, per my, my adorable slide of Angela holding up a glass, um, I just want to say a big cheers to you guys. It is deeply meaningful to a company like ours. We are small, we are scrappy. Um, we're out there in the trenches getting our hands dirty, trying to like move, you know, some whiskey. Sometimes that's not particularly glamorous, but the nights like this where I get to come and hang out with you and spend time with you and, and talk about the, the beautiful liquid that we make, these are the fun times, right? These are the times that we come together. And I always say like whiskey is never small talk. Whiskey is always big talk. If you want small talk, do, do tequila shots, you know? Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, I, I give a lot of different toasts, but this is one I actually specifically wrote for George. So with every dram enjoyed with friends and every story retold with a raised glass to those who came before and every moment made sweeter with a sip of this beautiful liquid and us being together tonight, we move one step closer to making the ultimate American single malt. And the whole reason behind that is we want to make a whiskey that we're proud of and that George would be proud of. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. I'm going to take a quick, uh, I, I, I would invite everybody, if you don't mind, will everybody just hold up your glass for me? I'm going to do a quick screenshot. See if I can do it simultaneously. Ah. Cheers, guys. Let's see. Oh, I love that red shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Five, six, seven, eight. Cool. Got it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, now let me share the results. So a, a bit of a housekeeping. So we ask people to rate everything on a scale of zero to 10. Five would be an average. Anything below five, obviously, people don't really care for. Anything above five, people do dig to two various, various degrees. Right. And normally, just just to give you an idea, um, if it's seven or above, uh, it normally becomes a selection for us. Uh, very rarely did we get barrels that scored above eight. Uh, we had a couple that scored eight. Uh, I don't think I think there was only one that was like probably uh, would have been a nine or even a ten. That's the four rows of 16 year old. But that's neither there nor there. Anyway, um, let's let's take it one at a time. So the first one we tried was a signature malt, your um, bread and butter, your baby. So uh, got a cumulative score of 6.6, .6, which is you know nearing seven, and that's a pretty respectable score, especially, keep in mind, this is a room full of bourbon drinkers. They're not American single drinkers. They're not sky drinkers, right? Uh, we have a few, obviously, that are, but for the most part, it's bourbon brew. Um, moving on to bourbon cask finish, uh, fared a little uh, lower, which was surprising to me. Um, I personally liked it better uh, than... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. This is a bourbon cast mention. Yes, that, that's not surprising. That is not surprising. I, I kind of fell into the same bucket there. Uh, so it scored 5.9 and you have just, you know, uh, typical uh, bell curve distribution. Um, moving on to the bourbon single cast finish. Now that scored higher, almost a full seven. Again, some people scored a 10, which is amazing. 
Uh, some people didn't care for it, but there was less of those people that actually did like it. Um, so the QV, regular QV cast finish uh, had a respectable score of seven, 6.9. Uh, again, somebody sported a full 10, which is amazing. And then, and that, this is the expression that it kind of like, I was curious to see, uh, scored almost a full eight. So if you just remember what I said about the scoring, this is amazing to me because normally those scores would be probably reserved for bourbon casks, not single American molds. Um, so people obviously dig it. And, and a, a bit of a background behind the sample, Parrish actually came to our retail uh, shop and tasted a uh, bunch of different things with my partner, including this one. And my partner, who some of you met, is a super conservative guy. Like, he never wants to pick anything. <laughs> uh, and he called me after that, and he said, you know what? This was pretty good. You should try it. And that's how the whole thing came about. So I, I really fantastic. insisted on this sample being included in a sample kit because I want to be uh, as many people in the club as possible to try it and to tell us what we think. And people obviously agree with us. Um, and that leaves the last one, Sherry Cast Finish, um, to 6.4 which is obviously not a surprise to me. Uh, as I said, this uh, if you're not a single mold drinker, that's probably not your jam. And um, uh, it getting at 6.4 is still pretty respectable. Now, there were a couple other questions here. And I basically I had to do, with, hey, should we bring this in or not? So the first question was about, OK, do you guys want us to bring in the bourbon cast finish? And most people said no, then yes, and not surprising. Uh, the next question had to do with the single QA cast, the one that we liked, and most people did like it. Uh, again, only sample size of 16, so uh, not something that I'm going to hang my head on, but definitely um, encouraging. And uh, the last question was, hey, if we only do one, which one would it be? Obviously, they said the QA. So that's that's the results of the survey. Um, I am encouraged to see that people did like the QA one. Uh, I obviously liked it the best out of the entire lot. Um, so that's what I'm going to leave you with. Uh, we do have another tasting coming up on Sunday for the crowd that couldn't make it today. I'll be curious to see how they, Paul, and uh, what would be uh, that reaction. Uh, but we'll make a determination right after that. And obviously, I'll keep everyone abreast as to what's going on. Matt, Again. thank you for, for keeping me honest. Uh, th these are not technically finishes. You're right. I'm so like inundated with the finished barrels, with the finished barrels. Like it's just kind of like it, it uh, is. And second like, habit now. It's yeah. no shame in the game, too, because, Michael, I, I even find myself, um, I have to be so precise with language around oh, the I... finishing conversation, because uh, people do really get like, deeply confused by it, like, like really, really deeply confused. And, um, I mean, I will even be in a store, and I'll be like, I just said finished, and what <laughs> I meant was, it is, you know, we, it has a, the whiskey has a finish, and I think this is one of those things that when you when you talk about people just being confused in the in the industry in general or in the whiskey in general is we have a lot of terms that are very confusing and interchangeable. Um, so I, I'm trying to get really precise in language, but uh, you're not you're not crazy. It happens to me all the time. It, I mean, constantly. I'll, I'll be like, yeah, it's finished, and they're like, nope, no, sir, it's not. It is not finished. All right, guys. Well, thank you for another great event. Um, we do this every month. Um, we have these. A wonderful tasting event uh, lined up all the way into the next year. Uh, so uh, if you guys are not on Discord, join. That's where we communicate most of these things. Uh, Jenny and the team, thank you so much for joining uh, us. Thank you pleasure. for meeting with me prior to this, to taking time. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I'm, um, I, this is the first time I've tried uh, your entire portfolio, and I have to say I'm impressed by it. Um, but guys, I just want to thank you so much. Um, Michael, obviously, we'll be in touch. We have a kind of a list of things to cover in the next week or so. And I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. I'm seeing some really beautiful faces. I'm also seeing some cool backgrounds, like that warehouse background you got going on down there. Um, and uh, it, it is always a pleasure to get to do what I do. I've been doing it a long time. And I, you know, I have the kind of job that people dream of, and I never take that for granted. So, thank yeah. You. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, look, have a good night. Um, appreciate your time, and I'll catch you guys on Discord. And Jenny, thank you so much. We'll be talking.